Most people don't know this, but using flashcards to study Chinese is actually not the best way to memorize Chinese characters. If that's the only thing that you're doing, you might be missing out on ways to maximize your Chinese learning for long-term retention. So in this video today, I'm going to be talking about the system that I use while I've been studying Chinese over the past seven years to help me go from knowing nothing to becoming fluent. If you're new to the channel, then welcome. And if you're returning, then welcome back. My name is Jackie. I'm a first generation Chinese American living in New York City. On this channel, I make videos about learning Chinese, living in New York, and trying to become an actor because that's something that I'm really passionate about and doing as I'm here in New York. A little bit of background on my Chinese learning journey. So I grew up in a Cantonese speaking household. My parents immigrated from Guangzhou sometime in the 80s, but Mandarin and Cantonese are altogether separate languages. It wasn't until I was 18 and a freshman in college when I really started learning Mandarin. And I didn't know anything. I didn't know about the tones. I didn't know how to write characters or read characters. And so when we had our assessment exam, I completely bombed it and got placed like everyone else who's starting out in beginner one, starting from scratch. After three years of studying in college, I studied abroad in Taiwan at National Taiwan University because I wanted an immersive environment where I could really become fluent in the language and get to a place where no matter how long I didn't use it for, I would still retain it. If you're interested, I did document some of my experiences there in Taiwan learning Chinese, and I'll link some of those videos either up here or down in the description below. It's now been three years that I've been back in the United States. I haven't learned Mandarin in any formal setting over the past three years, and it's really not within my daily use anymore outside of the occasional tutoring session that I have or the occasional call that I have with friends from Taiwan. But I feel like I've done a pretty good job of still maintaining my Chinese ability. And in this video, I'm gonna show you guys how I did it, so hopefully you can also maximize your long-term Chinese retention. To give you guys a sense of where I am now with Chinese, and you can compare this with one of my earlier videos, I'm definitely not as good as I used to be in Taiwan, but you know, for having lived in the United States for the past three years and now using English as my default language again, I think not terrible. Hello, 大家好,欢迎来到我的频道 是我怎么把中文拉到一个我一辈子都不会忘掉的水平，我怎么做到呢？在今天的影片，我会跟你们分享我学中文的方式，是一个我觉得很有架构的学习方式。so my main approach to studying Chinese can be broken down into four main components. The first is flashcards still. I know I mentioned at the start of this video that flashcards should not be the only thing that you're doing. But they're still really useful, and I think they're really useful because they take advantage of two really empirically proven study techniques. The first is active recall, it's forcing you to generate thoughts and recall words that you've learned before. And the second is spaced repetition, where you're learning characters at different intervals, so you're challenging yourself to remember it instead of just cramming it all into one period. Flashcards is only one part of the system. The second is an immersive environment. The third is self-talk or conversations with yourself. And then the final piece of it is conversations with other people. Before I dive into detail on any of these specific components, I wanna lay out a general framework that's gonna make it a little bit easier to understand why there are four components and why flashcards alone is not gonna be enough. When we think about learning languages, there are primarily two pieces of this. The first is inputs right here, and then the second is outputs. I'm sure most of you are already familiar with this from learning languages, but inputs are very basically the information that you digest, that you consume, and this can be conscious or subconscious. It can be conscious in the sense of you're listening to a podcast and you're writing down characters that you want to learn, but most of the time, let's say we're just walking on the street, whether or not we like it, there are inputs all around us and we're taking in that information. Outputs, on the other hand, always require some level of conscious effort, and it's basically what we produce, and it takes two forms, speaking and writing. And especially when you're learning a language, especially in the early stages, it takes a lot of effort to generate any sort of output. Because for most people, when you're starting out and learning a language, you're usually thinking in your native language first. For me, I start a thought in English, and then I figure out how I can say that thought in Mandarin. But as you get better in that language, you start to translate less and start to think more naturally in that language that you're learning. We can probably make a whole separate video just talking about that process, but high level inputs, outputs. We can further break down these categories into two subcategories. So we have visual and then we have auditory. Visual is what you can see. When we talk about inputs and outputs, the input is generally reading and the output is generally writing. 
The other category, auditory, is about listening and about speaking. Okay, so why does this matter? Well, it's within this framework that we can see why flashcards alone are not enough. When we think about flashcards in the context of the quadrant that we've just made, we can see that it's basically a visual input. And it's great for all the reasons that we talked about earlier, but you're not really hitting any of these other categories. You're not really learning about how that word gets used in its natural context in a real life setting. And because of that, you don't really learn how to develop a sense of the meaning of this character. That lack of context is something that we try to develop using other parts of the system. And that brings us to the second part of the framework, which is environmental immersion. So when I'm talking about environmental immersion here, I'm really talking about auditory and visual inputs. Whether it's reading, whether it's listening, you wanna make sure that you're seeing the words that you're learning in the context in which they're naturally used. That way you can see what kind of words and other sentences it pairs with. And you can also get a sense of like what it really means. Because oftentimes, especially in those beginning stages, when we learn characters, we're really just thinking about the definition. When you have an immersive environment, you start to develop that muscle of trying to understand how those things get used in a real life setting. So those two things kind of make up the impact input side, what might be even more important is the output. And the idea of that is kind of synthesized in a sentence that you'll oftentimes hear ABCs or American born Chinese people say who grew up speaking Cantonese. They'll say, sick teng, sick gong, which means I know how to listen to it, but I don't know how to speak it. And so the second two parts of the system are really where we start to develop that confidence in speaking Chinese. Output number one is self-talk. Self-talk at its basic level is very simple. It's just talking to yourself in whatever mediums that you like. If you wanted to practice your speaking with yourself, you could just talk out loud. You could record yourself talking like with a camera, or you can just kind of like read sentences out loud, anything to kind of get you using this language in communicating whatever it is that you wanna communicate. Writing is the other big portion of that. So for me, in order to build in a routine of learning to write in Chinese, and having that self-conversation with myself to figure out how I express myself in this language, I kept a journal. This was something that I started, not really in college, but afterwards when I studied in Taiwan, where I would do two things. I would have a daily journal where I'd write down all of my tasks, and then I would have a weekly journal, more of a weekly reflection, where I'd just write down a page no matter how long it took, and just kind of word vomit on the page, but doing so in Chinese. So I dug up my journal here, so I can show you guys an example of what that looks like. The daily journal looked something like this, where I just broke down every single day and the kind of tasks that I had to do that day. As you can see, it's super simple, and sometimes there are English words in there, but the whole purpose was to really like internalize use of the language. And if we get into one of the weekly reflections, it looks something like this. It's a small journal, it's a little bit bigger than my hand. And the whole idea is that no matter if it took 10 minutes or 30 minutes, I would just try to get my thoughts onto the page. And honestly, sometimes it was really difficult. I really struggled sometimes trying to communicate what it is that I wanted to say. Throughout that process of journaling, I would often look up characters, I would look up sentences online to see how people were communicating whatever it is that I wanted to communicate, but in that language, that was the key part. So that brings us to the final piece, which is conversations with others. From the previous three, we've covered all the inputs, we've covered some form of outputs, but what's missing from all of these so far? Feedback. When having conversations with others, whether it's through text, whether it's actual conversations in person, you really learn really quickly whether or not you're communicating clearly. And I remember a great example of this when, when I first moved to Taiwan, I used a couple of dating apps to really meet people because I didn't know anyone else there. And I remember texting a girl, a couple texts and she told me, you text like an old man. And the reason for that is because the way I'd learned to communicate was through schools, through all the kind of academic writing that I had learned. And so when I would text casually, I would use punctuation, I would say things in a certain way that just didn't feel totally right. And that was such a kind of learning moment for me because it made me realize that there was a big difference still between all the things that I'd learned and what was being used in a real life natural context. And that is the kind of feedback that I think you can only get when you're interacting with other people. One huge advantage of having conversations with other people is that you also just learn a lot, not just about the stuff that you already know, but you learn about new ways to communicate, new ways to express. And if you're lucky and have someone who's very patient with you as well, you also get someone who can explain to you and teach you a lot of new words, new phrases, uh, and culture as well. So I know the things that we've been talking about so far have been pretty conceptual. It's a framework, it's an approach for how to study Chinese, but I also want to make sure that you have something concrete so that after watching this video, you can take action and start utilizing these things. Flashcards is number one. If you aren't using flashcards already, it is something, despite how much I'm kind of rallying against it, that is useful. It just shouldn't be the only thing that you're doing. 
the flashcard system that I've used and a lot of language learners have used is called Anki, A-N-K-I. I can put a link down in the video below. What I really like about Anki that's a little different from other flashcard systems, especially kind of manual written ones, is that it asks you at the end of every card whether or not you thought it was easy or difficult. So if it was easy, then it's going to start shuffling those out and you won't see them anymore. But for the ones that you find difficult, and that's where we get into space repetition, it's going to keep showing you those over time until eventually those become easy. So that way you're spending the most amount of time on the characters that you find the most difficult, and it kind of maximizes your learning in that way. That's flashcards. When we talk about an immersive environment, for me personally at least, the auditory component was the most important, where I really wanted to hear how people were using the language. At a beginner stage, it's sometimes difficult to find materials that are suitable for your level. There are a couple of YouTube channels and podcasts that I'll link below in the description that I've found really helpful throughout all the stages of my journey. I've also found that other YouTubers have just made some really good content about this and they've recommended content that I've just personally found super, super useful. I'll link those down below so that you can kind of play around for yourself to see what level you're at and what makes sense for you. I think something really important to highlight there is it's not just about the learning and peer educational value. It's really about having fun while you're doing it. Even if something's at your level, if you don't enjoy listening to it, I don't think there's a point in forcing yourself to do that. One example of how I use my own interests is I watch anime except with Chinese characters. And at the time, I really liked anime because the plots were simple, it was exciting, there are a lot of visuals that communicate what the story's about. So even as I was learning the language, if I didn't know 100% of the text, because most times I didn't, I was still able to figure out what they're saying and use context clues to help me understand and over time, that really helped me to stay engaged with the material that I was watching. That brings us to self-talk. So I already mentioned journaling is a fantastic way to do that. I think filming yourself is also a great way to do that. It can sometimes feel a little awkward, and I've definitely had videos where I just recorded them and never shared them with anybody. And one thing I really like about that is that you can look back at that a couple years later and think like, wow, look at how much progress you've made. When I look back at the first video I've ever made, freshman year of college, and compare that to where I was in Taiwan, where I was now, the difference is huge. And I think having those milestones to remind you of your progress is also something that's super cool. Final piece, conversation, is probably the most difficult if one, you're in a non-Chinese speaking country, which most people who are learning Chinese are, and two, if you're not learning Chinese in any kind of formal setting. When you're in school, you have office hours, you have access to classmates, you have access to your professors and teachers, and that's something that you can build a community around. When you're studying Chinese by yourself, especially not in a school setting, it's a little more difficult to find that community. Something that I did before I moved to Taiwan because I really wanted to start getting practice with native speakers is I downloaded a language exchange app and I joined some language exchange groups on Facebook. I don't remember the exact name of the app that I used, but I'll dig that up and I'll put that on a link below. It was really helpful for connecting me with people who spoke Chinese fluently and also people who were willing to engage in this conversational teaching practice because they would want to learn English and then I would want to learn Chinese. Sometimes it's, you know, a set time, like maybe this week we're just only going to use Chinese, next week we're going to use English, or we'll just go back and forth with it. Different approaches for different people. But that really helped me get practice and get feedback from someone who uses and understands the language far better than I do. This conversation can be pretty difficult if you're living in a place that doesn't have a lot of Chinese speakers. So I really recommend taking advantage of online communities and online resources such as that app, such as, you know, different language exchange groups. And if you're watching this video, there are likely many others who are also watching this who want to learn Chinese and who are looking for that community. So maybe one way is to leave a comment down below if you're looking for someone to practice with and build that community. Even if it's just someone who helps you to stay accountable and make sure that you're staying consistent and practicing all the time, that's really helpful because learning languages is a really long journey. I've been doing this for seven years now. And to me, it's a lifelong journey. So whatever victories you can find along the way, whatever people you have that can share that journey with you is really special. That seems like a good note to end on. So in this video, I talked about things that I did do that helped me learn Chinese and maximize Chinese retention in the long term. If you want to learn more about the things I wish I didn't do and probably should have avoided, then you can check out this video. I think if I had not done these things, I probably could have 2x or even 3x my Chinese learning. Thank you so much for watching this video. I will see you guys next time. See you at the end.